remain. I'm very honored to be asked to share the word with you and, and take the responsibility very seriously to be entrusted with the pulpit for Sabbath morning. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and share with you a message that I think is just a fascinating message. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore and sat down with baskets and sorted the good fish into baskets and the bad fish they threw away. The same way as it will be at the end of the age when angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and cast them into a fiery furnace and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The hallmark of Jesus' public evangelism was the parable. And I would like to ask you to turn to Mark verse 4. And we're going to look at Mark verse 4, verses 32. I'll use uh, this uh, Bible. Mark 4, 33 and 34. And that's page 870. 75, 875, 33 and 34. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. So it's clear that the parable it was his initial contact with people. And I, I think that a interesting sermon would be, and Mark, I thought of you uh, when you mentioned a couple weeks ago about ideas for sermons, and I think this might be a, a, an, it's an interest to me that how God orchestrated his three and a half year ministry uh, is very, I think, I mean, a lot of, well, divine guidance went into how Christ um, did his ministry, just as a brief, as I see it, just and look, putting together my talk on Jesus the storyteller and parables, that Jesus started after he was baptized and was uh, tried in the wilderness, that he met with large, drew large crowds and he told them fascinating stories that were very different from the rabbis and the scribes and Pharisees of the temple. And he would not only gave them, but they were, were so enwrapped with his storytelling that they had forgotten their meals and then he provided them with meals. So on two occasions he fed 5,000 and then he fed two groups. And they were, he, he it was like his public um, grand opening of his ministry so that everyone, name recognition, everyone knew what, what he was about. And they were going to make him their king. And they un misunderstood him that he was going to be the king uh, uh, and he was came to be a spiritual leader, not a physical leader. And they were going to make him king, but he said that's not his purpose. And he backed away and he then went into a phase of more secluded or individual ministries. And if you remember when he would heal someone, he would say, don't say who did that. Don't say, he kind of led lay low. And he worked. Then when it came time for the, the prophecy to be the week, the week would be cut off in the middle of the week, three and a half year ministry, he started attacking the Pharisees and the status quo, and uh, he used the, the parables to really uh, needle those people and to actually uh, bring them to a point where they were just angry, angry with him. And it was with, the, you know, orchestrated with the Holy Spirit, but it's, I mean, I think it's a marvelous story how he orchestrated his whole ministry on earth that he designed it, and so much of it is through the storytelling and through parables, how powerful they could be. And that's, that's what I'd like to look at this morning, is his, the parables and the stories that he told. So a parable is a common instructional strategy that Jesus adopted. It was customary in the Jews to tell parables. Jesus didn't invent or develop the parable literary device. It was already in place in you know, common among the Jews, but he took it and perfected it. And now, when we think of parables, that's who we think about. I mean, he's really made it his own. Although there are parables written of a secular nature, and Jesus doesn't have a corner on the market, but they are the most well-known parables. A parable is a 
simple narrative which can be true, fictitious, or fanciful, which illustrates a moral, spiritual, practical, or theoretical truth. And the, there's two truths of the parable that I recited at the beginning of the, hunt, of the net. Uh, the truth, first truth of that parable is the dividing between the righteous will be divided from the unrighteous. And there is a secondary uh, principle of truth in that there will be some wicked who do not become righteous. And that's a theme that comes up in Jesus' parables. So a parable is a, a simple narrative which uh, develops briefly a setting and a character and a series of events that ends with the consequences of those events. And as I was reading the parables, um, it reminded me of folk tales that many of us, and I hope that some of you are, you are familiar with your folk tales. I had, after looking at Jesus' parables and the lessons and the, and the truths that come from his parables, could see many um, parallels in folk tales from, from Europe. As the, from my being Anglo-American, my folk tale then are found in Europe. And many of the tales, they are the values of the culture. So, in uh, European folk tales, you have to pass a test, and oftentimes it's a test of kindness, and then um, you are dependent upon your quick thinkingness, your wit, and your cunning. And I know that in America we had the experience in our history of the westward expansion and the idea of the frontier, but we have in America a very um, value placed on, on uh, self-reliance and free individualism, and I, we get that from our folk tales. And I'm, um, I, th that I would just invite you to think back on your folk. Another interesting thing, every, every culture has a creation story, and every culture has a flood story. And I was wondering, what is our, what is our flood story? I don't know, we don't have a flood, a, 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 a folk tale that's a flood story. And then it dawned on me that our, in our, <laughs> I'm saying our, in my, I gotta say, in my American, Anglo-American culture, it is the story of Noah, is the one that is in our culture, we didn't know the story of Noah very well, and it is in that genre of uh, folk tales. Although, in our case, we put a lot more, it's um, much more um, emphasis, and we, they're much more important, of, and we, we believe they are actually, actually historic events that happened. Okay, so a character a parable is a character that faces a questionable decision, a moral decision, and he has to decide the consequences of that decision, and it's the consequences of that decision. An extended, a parable is an extended simile, and I, I included a handout in the, my you might take that handout out there. I, I, for your interest in, in uh, post-church browsal, I've listed the 40 parables that are listed in the Adsonic Adventist Bible, Common Bible Dictionary. This is, comes from a larger tale, table. If you look this up, for each of the parables, it gives the, the consolidating principle that it tells. And I thought... It would be interesting to go through this list of what it is and you know, uh, how often did Jesus put points. And I thought I would do a little analysis of the messages that come from the parables. But I found that there are as varied as the parables. There is some overlap, but there isn't major categories of parables. And each parable has a little different slant on it. And it's like, um, it reminded me that Jesus, in his parables, sowing his, he sowed parables, and he, some fell on um, the good ground, some fell on the hard ground, and it was, uh, actually he lived the parables that he told, and I'm going to come back to that point a little bit later, but if you look this up in the, in the Bible dictionary, each parable has a main thought, the main truth that it teaches. There is, um, this is slightly different than the list in the Bible commentary. There is not only parables that Jesus told, but Jesus told allegories as well, as well as simile and metaphor. So, 
I'll give you a uh, example here of um, a simile is a short something is like so Matthew three sixteen the spirit descended like a dove that would be a simile but the parable is an extended simile the kingdom of heaven is like the treasure hidden in the field and like uh, we started the sermon with um, once again the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake so that is what a parable is and is, is, is an extended simile um, the Hebrew word for parable is one thing thrown up alongside another for the sake of comparison so that's a simile but Jesus also used metaphor, and that is when something is said to be this, this something. So a metaphor is Matthew 5.13, ye are the salt of the earth. And an allegory, there are fewer allegories in the scripture, but there are allegories nevertheless. And the one that we read for the responsive reading, John 10, and we read, um, well it was more than one day, that Jesus is the good shepherd, and Jesus is the vine are allegories. And there are Old Testament allegories. Uh, the poor man and the ewe lamb, you'll remember that, is the message of Nathan coming in and he told David a story about the poor man which the rich, his rich neighbor came and took his single ewe lamb and fed it to his guest. And David was angry and he said, that man should really be punished. And Nathan said, David, you are the man. And uh, so that there's um, an interesting one in Ezekiel. It's, this is a message of uh, Jerusalem's destruction that's put on the cooking pot. And then Hagar and Sarah is one that we read about, but we don't realize about the allegory of Hagar is the children of comparing children of the promise and children of not of Israel. So, they're not of the, they would be the, uh, those not in spiritual Israel, but uh, Sarah represents those that are in spiritual Israel. And then I found some fables, and a fable also has a message, but it uses um, personification of animals or plants. And these are interesting, if you read the context, it is a a person saying he's got a message. There's messages here in these and it is implied in, in the fable. So the trees wanted a king and um, then the thistle wanted a cedar's daughter. A plant planted, a eagle planted a seed in good soil. Those are some fables. And then another figurative speech that Jesus used is the hyperbole, which is an overstatement or an exaggeration. So if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, he cannot be my disciple. So um, a parable then is a comparison. It can be a proverbial saying, a type, figure, symbol, or an illustration. Okay, why did Jesus use stories why did he choose parables and why what makes stories seem so effective or why are stories seem so effective and uh, I think that this answers the question as to why Jesus chose to tell stories from creation we've been storytellers I, mean, I can imagine Adam telling Cain and Abel stories of their experience in the Garden of Eden um, we we, long before there was writing, humans told stories and passed down the values from generation to generation. And I, it's interesting that um, the oldest story we have that's recorded has, was found in the 19th century. They were, uh, archaeologists were digging out the library at Nineveh and they came across some uh, clay tablets that inscribed the Epic of Gilgamesh. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. That's uh, it's a tale, the oldest tale that we have record of, and it, Bible scholars have reason to believe that Gilgamesh was actually Nimrod from the Bible. And it's interesting that there, in this tale of, Gil, of, of Gilgamesh, that there is a account of the flood in that that is quite similar to the Genesis account. The oldest 
re written record we have of someone telling else a story is that of Cheops. And uh, a papyrus was discovered in the 19th century again that uh, record the story of Cheops, and he is the pyramid builder in Egypt on the plains of Giza. He built the biggest pyramid, and his sons told him stories, and there's a record of the stories that his sons told. In China, the first record of storytelling is 770 BC, and then later, after Christ's time, monks went, were in China in AD 618, and they also used story as a way of spreading their faith. So we have, as humans, a long history of storytelling and listening. And we are storytellers, and we are all story listeners. If you think about conversations, when, when you sit at the supper table and you exchange, how did the day go, a story comes up. And that is how our mind works, stories. I think that's got to be a creation that God created us, that narrative gives us meaning. And we think in language, and I have this, I know my speculation here, um, but I, I have this lay theory that we only remember as early as we have language to remember, because we think in language. And our lives take on meaning as we overlay a narrative on our lives. So we can say good experiences, bad experiences, and how things are going through narrative. It gives meaning to our life. And I think this is key why Christ chose parables. Um, there was a research uh, study done to check out the power of storytelling in education. A researcher went to a fourth grade class and the first class, he read the story. No, the first class, he gave the story to the fourth graders, asked them to read it. The second classroom, he went, he read the story to the, to the class. Then he showed a video of the story, and then he told the story in the fourth class. A month later, he came back and checked for details how much they remembered the story. And, of course, the one that they remembered the most, the class they remembered the most, was the one that had been told the story. The class that had been remembered the least was the video story, and I think that we could um, know the reason why. In, in a video, there is our minds are much more passive. Everything, the graphic, the visual, it's all there in our minds, and we work less hard to form an image in a video. Then uh, the, the other least time for least was the story that the students read, and there could be other literacy issues, which is why that was such a poor one, but the, when he read it to them, that was the second most. And um, uh, another incident, another anecdote of the power of story, Kendall, Kendall Haven, a professional storyteller, went to a school, and he was met, and he, as he was in the school, walking down the hall, a second grade girl passed him and said, oh, I recognize you, you're the storyteller. And he had come a year earlier, and at that presentation he had developed a new story that was original with him, and he had not been to that school since. And this girl says, oh, I remember that story, and she turned around and told him that story with remarkable details and got the events all together, and it was it's amazing that she could remember for a whole year. A band teacher uh, on a summer we took a summer workshop, and he's, he's he on storytelling. And he thought, how can I put storytelling into my band? Well, he one of the pieces that they were going to work on the following fall was Vivaldi, or a couple of Vivaldi pieces. And so he put together and developed a story on Vivaldi. And at the beginning of the year, he told the story of Vivaldi. Lo and behold, those students practiced Vivaldi. They, he had always had them take their... Uh, notes and keep their log of their practice time. They practiced Vivaldi, they went to the library to find more information on Vivaldi, and it really added interest to his whole uh, band system because of that storytelling. Now, um, and I, I think all of that is why Jesus chose the literary device of story, of parable. Now, there are a list of, it, of things found to be helpful for story. And you may think as I go through those, you may sort through these and say, oh, that's a good one. Oh, yeah, that was not so valuable. But here is a list that have been found to be the benefits of storytelling. Improves language. 
reading, speaking, writing. Information is remembered longer. The girl in the school told that story, those fourth graders. It motivates students to learn. That's the Vivaldi. They went and got more information on Vivaldi based on that. Um, builds self-confidence as a storyteller and as a listener. Develops the imagination, and that is uh, part of why we have to work at story when we listen. We have to visualize it and see it in our imagination. Develops our imagination, it engages and entertains, and I think those are important elements of why Jesus selected parables as his um, presentation. Creates a sense of connectedness. When the storyteller, you make that connection with, with, story, with the storyteller, you have that connectedness as well as sharing this experience with those around you. And the last one improves problem solving skills. And we like that in education, we like that improves problem solving skills. And what, what happens there is the, um, when you listen to a story, you have to keep the elements, the setting, the characters separate, the events that happen, the sequence, and then at the conclusion, when the thing is resolved, then you put that whole thing together and it's like a puzzle. And that's very good for your mind work. And that, it goes a long ways to explain why those fourth graders remembered the story that he told more than the, the other stories, especially more than the video. So, here back to Jesus' applications now. And his application, he took scenes from everyday life, <coughs> scenes that they were familiar with, they had seen, uh, some of the scenes happened that they were right happening on a distant hill when he was sitting uh, telling the stories. But he would tell these scenes in simple conclusions and that they would um, they were simple and brief and had obvious conclusions. So if you could look at uh, let's see I want to look at Matthew 21 for how marvelous Jesus, and what his skill was. I mean, I, I am I'm amazed at, Jill, at Jesus, how he orchestrated and worked these, these uh, parables. So look at Matthew 21. Oh yeah, I was going to turn in this other Bible so I give the page number. And I want you first to look at uh, verses 28 to 30. Matthew 21. 28, okay, that's 860. So he's telling uh, sons, there was a man, what do you think it was, a man had two sons? What do you think, there was a man who had two sons, he went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But he later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said, the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? And they answered without even thinking, well, the first, they answered. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe them. The tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So, he is getting them so involved with the story, they're not thinking about the implications, and they just answer, and then it comes back at them. And he does that twice. And the second one is in uh, verse 40 to 41. It's the parable of the tenants and the power. This is the one that the pastor read to us for our scripture. And down... Um, So therefore, this is verse 40, verse 40, therefore, and this is, oh, th this is from Matthew, this version, therefore when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And Jesus asked that of the Pharisees, and then they answered, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give them his share of the crop of the harvest. And Jesus said to them, have you never read the scripture, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, and given 
to a people who will produce fruit. He who falls on his stone will be broken to pieces, but he who falls on it will be crushed. When the priests, chief priests and Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them, and they looked for ways to arrest him. But they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So this is part of the phrase, part of his um, ministry where he was antagonizing those um, Pharisees. So it was clear, and they would even answer out before they followed about him, before they followed exactly the meaning of what the parable was about. So the parable was a bridge. It was from the known to the unknown, from the concrete to the abstract, from the seen to the unseen, from the earthly to the heavenly, and uh, he opened vistas of heaven through his parables. So the parables drew the crowds, drew attention, and that's going back to our list of how does story help us. He drew the attention and he engaged them in those stories. They stayed and listened. He aroused their interest. He entertained them with those stories. The um, information was remembered longer, so that when those scenes saw, when they saw the sower again, when they saw different scenes, they would remember, oh yeah, that reminded me, and when it came back to mind, they could visualize that in their mind's eyes, so they could remember longer. And it stimulated inquiry. Remember those students that went to the library for Vivaldi? Look who came and asked Jesus for more information. Nicodemus, he heard all those. So that it was a, an entry level. And so Jesus came and he talked to people as they were interested, as they selected, as they turned to be good ground and selected those things and became, <coughs> Jesus talked to them and they created additional inquiry. And it creates a sense of connectedness with the storyteller. And don't you, I mean, I would just love to have sat in that crowd when Jesus was telling stories and I can just imagine the difference between Jesus' approach, his personal, his personality, and telling those people stories that, that were just amazing to them. Um, we talked a little bit about the Old Covenant, of, of the do's and the don'ts of the Old Covenant, and here Christ took the principles of, and I'm going to use the word New Covenant here, Pastor, but he, he presented it in a new and vibrant way that just really appealed to those people. So, um, listeners, oftentimes the Pharisees uh, did a, they give a verdict on themselves without knowing it. And they had a paradoxical quality about them, parables. Parables and allegories had a paradox about them that the, it was, it, it, it clouded or shaded truth from people not ready to receive it, but it opened truth in the minds of those people who were on the inside. So he could tell a story, and the Pharisees, not understanding at all, were just responding at the surface level of the story, and they would easily be drawn into what the answer would be, and Jesus had a different, completely deeper meaning that, that they didn't see, but that the whole crowd could see. And I know that the Holy Spirit is a big part of that, whose minds and hearts were open to Jesus' teachings, but um, it, it, that is a quality of parables and of allegories that you don't see, that you don't, you, you, there's meanings that are, can be hidden. And we've seen that with um, Gulliver's Travels, and um, which was a satire on the society from which he came, and George Orwell's Animal Farm, in which you, you know exactly inside of what they're talking about, the you know, communist society, then George Orwell's uh, Animal Farm makes a lot of sense. So, it prevented the spies from, from reporting back. Oftentimes, they would, they would send spies, they were always following Jesus around, and they were listening carefully to trip him up on the doctrine. And he would tell a story, and it would deflate them, they had nothing upon which to stand. They would take back and they would repeat these stories, because the spies were not on the inside track of Jesus' um, presentation. So, how do we handle, and how much information can we take from a parable? 
And that's, I included that, I thought this was an important aspect of parable study, that we don't close read, you don't close read a parable, and I've listed the principles of parable interpretation, and this comes from our from the Bible commentary. Um, don't read more into a parable, there's a central truth to a parable, and that's it. Don't, don't be trying to pick, find meaning in there, it can be, it can be very, uh, it, it can prove to be uh, not a, a profitable time. But it is a mirror of truth, it's not truth itself, but it illustrates, it's a symbol, it's a type, a symbol, a um, illustration of truth. You have to know the context. The context in which a parable is given is the most is very important, as well as Christ's own introduction and conclusion really add a lot to what we're supposed to get from the parable. The places, circumstances, persons to whom it was spoken, the problem under discussion must be taken in consideration and it must be made the key to interpretation. Every parable illustrates one fundamental aspect of spiritual truth. Details of the parable are significant only as they contribute to the clarification of the particular point of truth. Before the meaning of the parable in the realm, in the spiritual realm, can be understood, it is necessary to have a clear picture of the situation described in the parable. In terms of oriental customs, modes of thought and expression, parables are vivid word pictures that must be seen, so to speak, before they can be understood. And in view of the fundamental fact that a parable is given to illustrate truth, and usually one particular truth, no doctrine may be based upon the incidental details of the truth. Uh, and uh, that what comes to mind there, and I don't know if we'll, I don't think we're going to have time to go through it, but rich man and Lazarus is a, is and it, um, Jesus actually used a uh, it's, it's a uh, otherworldly setting for the rich man and Lazarus, and it is um, interesting that he did that, and it's, it's certainly not something we can put any doctrinal truth on the parables. And the last one, that the parable in whole and in part must be interpreted in terms of the truth it was designed to teach, as set forth in a literal language in the intermediate context and elsewhere in Scripture. So in the last few minutes we have remaining, I would like to take a close look at Luke 16, verses 1 to 9. And this is not a common parable, that's why I chose it. Luke 16, 1 to 9, and that is on page 912 in the Bible. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to bathe. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? Eight hundred gallons of olive oil, they replied. The manager told them, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it four hundred. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told them, Take your bill and make it eight hundred. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people in the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, I don't know. Our, our Bible commentaries don't tell us what, what Jesus meant by you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. But I can tell you that it's not the New Jerusalem that is the eternal dwellings these men will be welcomed into. And it is unusual that the, um, that the owner would commend the manager instead of scolding him, and he commends him for acting shrewdly. Um, if we take a look now at what is actually going on, we have to go back a couple chapters 
two, and I got to get I, when I did this. Let's see. It's when Jesus narrow door. I think it starts with uh, Luke fourteen twenty five. If this is the place there were disciples. Oh, let's no. Let, we don't have to go back there. Let's go back to fifteen. Luke fifteen, the parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the disciples and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And this is what prompts the parables that Jesus tells in chapter 15. And then it comes to 16, and there's a subtle difference here, because the, the Pharisees and scribes are still there. But Jesus tells his, and it's like he changes his focus, and he's not addressing all the crowd now, He's telling this little story to his disciples, but in fact, it's all about the eavesdroppers, the servants, or the, the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees. So when he tells this story of the unjust manager, in which the unjust manager was a clever guy, but he was stealing from the owner, and the owner commended him because of his shrewdness, but it was not a compliment of the saints. So he is saying that he is actually saying, when he's talking to the disciples, he knows that it's the Pharisees that are out there, and he's telling them, you go ahead and do what you need to do. It is um, I, the worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed in eternal dwellings. He is telling that to the Jews, and they get his message. If you skip on down, that um, oh, to verse 14 now, because he said, talking, talking about handling money, the Pharisees who loved the money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. And the message from this parable is that Take care of what you do now, because it will have an impact on your life in the next life. And so then he, and he, again, really attacked those Pharisees for the specific purpose that his ministry was coming to an end, and um, that concluded his ministry on earth. But it is, I think, just marvelous that Jesus understood the dynamics and the benefits of storytelling, and use those throughout his storytelling to make such an impact on the world. And then uh, the apostles, afterward, you know, they says in scripture they turned the world upside down. Christianity turned the world upside down when they spread those twelve apostles with, um, went over the earth and and um, made it just a huge impact. And it's because of story. That's that's what I'd like to leave. With us and, and uh, think about that when you when you hear about Jesus' life and his story telling.